Hello everyone, welcome to Thursday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Now before we get straight into it, and I'm going deep straight away with the first news story. It's the biggest story of the day and it's the one we'll spend most of our time talking about. Before we get into that, let me just do a bit of uh, housekeeping. First and foremost, if you're not done already, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you know when we go live with our live videos. I know a few people left comments yesterday saying the video didn't get pushed to them when it got dropped. So if you haven't been pushed the video yet and you don't know about it, we posted the video yesterday. Go and follow it up there. Check it out so you can get up to speed on everything at CPCN. Secondly, our Instagram account, cyclinghub underscore CPCN. Yesterday, we did a giveaway for another pair of Wahoo socks. If you want to be part of that, again, if you didn't see yesterday's video, you'll not know. So we've just extended that giveaway another day. Make sure you go over to that uh, in the link down below and you can enter that giveaway for a pair of Wahoo socks. I'll do the giveaway tomorrow. Also, if you don't know already and you're interested in buying some Wahoo products, follow the affiliate link down below. A couple of people commented yesterday saying that they purchased Wahoo products because of us, but they purchased them from Amazon or, or, or the retailers. Follow the affiliate link down below. We get a little bit of a kickback, so it helps the channel out no end. And also, Wahoo can actually see where you're getting your products from. So if they can see a lot of people buying the products from us, then it helps, again, it helps our channel out no end when it comes to asking Wahoo for some free stuff to give away, if you know what I mean. Yeah, can you do all that? Wicked. Right, and a brand new transition, oosh. All right, I'll be honest, this is about the eighth time I've tried to record this because I, I just, I don't know which direction to go with it. Um, the main story I want to talk today about, it, it's more of a question, and it's a question that Jesper wanted us to ask last week. Um, in the wake of Bjorg Lambrecht's crash, I, I, I just felt it was a little bit too soon to actually bring the subject up. The video we made about Bjorg and, and tributing him, I, I felt that we, it needed to be just about him and not about the dangers of cycling. But ultimately, what we want to ask you is, do you think road racing is becoming more dangerous? Now, I say this today because Tim de Klerk from uh, De Quick Quickstep tweeted this out yesterday. Hypocrisy of the cycling world. First, we have a really touching moment of silence for Bjorg. Five minutes later, we have to destroy each other again on a bike lane wide parkour with a million corners. Marcel Seberg also commented under that saying, so right, Tim, every race has to get more crazy and more dangerous. That's just terrible. And for me, it has to change quickly. Please, more safety for us riders. But he wasn't the only one to complain about it. Paul Martins also complained about it saying, as riders, we should feel personally offended by these types of parkour for three days in a row. Every year it's getting worse. Hashtag CPA, hashtag Bink Bank Tour. And then you've got Edward Turns tweeting this video out about the Bink Bank Tour. And Bob Jungle said, I guess that most of the riders will agree with me that today's laps in stage three of Bing Bang Tour weren't exactly in favor of our security, which results in unnecessary stress crashes. The question is, do we really have to wait until an incident happens before we change something? Now, obviously safety is at the forefront of everybody's uh, minds at the minute in the wake of Bjorg Lambrecht's crash. I don't think there's a rider, a fan, or, or anyone involved in professional cycling who hasn't taken a step back and, and thought about this question and said, you know, is, is cycling too dangerous? Uh, do we have to wait, like, like Bob Jungle says, are we gonna have to wait till something happens in this race for them to actually sort it out? But, but where, where does the blame lie, I guess the question is. Is it, is it on the organizers for, for organizing parkours that are too, too dangerous? But what is it that defines a dangerous parkour? Is it the tight and twisted nature of it? Is it the, the amount of road furniture that's there? Is it the amount of safety officials that are there? Um, because a road might necessarily be dead straight, but you might find that no one's actually covering the crossing points and, and people are free just to go up and down. And, and that in effect would be more dangerous than a, a, a tightly secure winding road that leads to the finish. I think a lot of it has to do with, with the riders and I'm not blaming the riders for this one bit. It's, Maybe not the riders, but the nature of the race, the, the way that the race has unfolded up to that point. For instance, yesterday, everyone at the Bing Bang Tour uh, was racing for a sprint finish. And, and when you've got that sprint finish, you've got a lot of teams wanting to get to the front. You've got a lot of people jostling for position at high speed. And coming into tight, twisty sections, 
yes, it is bloody dangerous. However, think about how different that race would have been had six riders got off the road and there was a break of six riders all working together, coming into that tight twisty section, they would have just got through it without even, a, without even a thought about how dangerous it was. The peloton would have known that a brake had gone up the road and potentially might not be chasing it. So they've eased off the gas and they're not going as fast. So when they get to it, oh yeah, granted there's a lot of them to get through it, but because they're going at such a slower pace, no one's really jostling for position, they can just meander through it. And, and again, it's not a dangerous situation anymore. Hi, it's me, Post, uh, post Edit Pritchard. Um, this has been a really difficult uh, story to, to cover in the fact that every time I keep talking about it, I go off on a tangent uh, uh, and I, I lose track of, of what I'm trying to say. Um, but I think I've got it. I think, I think, I think I'm, I'm happy with my conclusion now. Ultimately, organisers have to take into consideration the rider's safety and I don't feel that they're doing that adequately enough. I, I don't feel that there's enough... Um, pre-checks when it comes to organizing routes. Uh, now, I fully appreciate and understand that you can't go through everything with a fine tooth comb. Uh, and, and as you look down a road, planning whether you're gonna organize a race down here, look at every single thing that could go wrong in there and go, right, because if you did, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do anything. Take Bjorg's tragic accident, for instance. He crashes, it's no help to anybody, but he crashes five meters later. He rolls onto the top of the cement. He crashes five meters previously and he rolls into the ditch, gets back up on his bike and goes. And I don't think you can, you can't cover for every single eventuality when it comes to bike racing. And it was just a tragic accident what happened to, to, to Bjorg. Uh, but I do feel that organizers, especially when it comes into those, those last couple of kilometers, that the organizers seriously need to sit down and think about how is this gonna be approached? Um, let's look at it from worst case scenario as an organizer and that's the whole peloton coming into here flat out everybody jostling for position, everybody trying to get their sprinter to the front. How is that gonna play out on this kind of parkour? If it's gonna play out safely as, or as safely as it can, then boom, we're on to a winner. Uh, but also you look at that video from Edward Turns and is there enough security that um, organizers are putting in place to stop people doing this? Now, according to Marcus Berghardt, who also tweeted about this, he said the person that walked out in front of the peloton um, had, had a disability and he, and he didn't know he was or he didn't know the race was going on or there were I think there was a little more to that story than simply somebody walking out in front of uh, the bike race regardless of that man's situation he should never have been in the, the the position to be able to walk out in front there should have been some sort of security there to to hold him back now I don't doubt for one second it's it must be extremely difficult to organize a race you've got a million and one different things you've got to take into consideration I think first and foremost at the top of that needs to be rider safety. That needs to be paramount. You can't organize a race without that in mind right at the top of the list. But then you've got to think, how, how are the riders actually going to enjoy this race? Is it going to be a technical race that's going to challenge them? Not only who's got the, 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 the most power in their legs that day, but who's got the, the tactical nouns to, uh, to, to win that race as well? And who's got the skills to be able to win that race? If you make it too sterile for a rider, they're not gonna wanna ride it. So you've gotta take into consideration how a rider's actually gonna enjoy that. Then you've got sponsors to please. You've also got the people around the, the villages, the townships, the town centers that are gonna be affected by that race. So then you, you need to look at how you could potentially change that parkour to, to sue everything that's going on around uh, a cycling race and then obviously you've got to entertain the fans you've got to make this a a fun spectacle um so i don't doubt that it's, it is a very difficult situation that they're in and, and it must be difficult to plan a safe spectacle when it comes to to cycling now this might sound like an unpopular opinion and don't forget this is me just looking from the outside in if you're a professional cyclist if you're part of the scene then feel free to leave a comment below and let me know you know if i'm right or wrong about this but i feel that that the riders also need to take a bit of responsibility for this because ultimately once the organizers have organized this race the parkour is the parkour um, taken at 10 kilometers an hour it is perfectly safe taken at 60 kilometers and it becomes a different kettle of fish there is huge risk involved in, in negotiating that parkour but athletes are by nature competitive and they will commit and risk everything in an attempt to win a race, or at least put their teammates in a position to be able to win a race. Christine Mahers post, forgive me if that pronunciation is wrong, posted on the Vox Women blog about the dangers 
of cycling and how it's affected her since the death of Björg Lambrecht. And one point I want to pick up on is, is when she says, they say crashing is part of the job. I say them, it isn't. It's again just another quote out of a book which is funny as long as you don't finish in the hospital or worse. Now, I'll be honest, I have to disagree with that. Um, I think, especially when it comes to racing, every time you put your leg over a bike, you are accepting the responsibility that there could be a crash and you could be involved in it. Um, I, th I don't think there's any racer that doesn't think that that could happen. No one ever expects it to happen, and we hope every time we do, it isn't going to happen, but there is a high possibility that you're going to crash. Um, and it's not always down to the organisers organising a bad parkour. It's down to the amount of people willing to take risks in that race that could eventually lead to a crash. Now, a bike race, by its nature, is, is asking the question of the riders, who wants to risk the most? Who's willing to risk the most to try and win this race? Now, leave your comments down below and let me know, what do you think to this? Do you think racing is getting more dangerous? Do you, or, or do you just think riders are willing to risk more nowadays than they used to back in the day? Um, leave your comments down below and let me know. All right, let's move on to transfer news now because there's been some big movements in the transfer window over the last couple of days. Sunweb have just confirmed that T... Well, they did it yesterday, but Tij Banu is going to Sunweb. Movie star have signed two riders coming from Astana, Dario Cataldo and Davide Vialella. And Andre Zeitz has moved from his long-term team at Astana where he was there for 12 years. He's moved across to Mitchelton Scott for the 2020 season. Now, great news for us cycling fans, terrible news for the rest of the professional peloton. Mathieu van der Poel is back racing on his road bike. Over on Cycling News, they report that van der Poel is back on his road bike, racing the Arctic Tour with his sights set on the Yorkshire Worlds. Van der Poel has spent the summer racing his mountain bike, winning no fewer than three rounds of the World Cup, having what they say is a breakthrough in the discipline to the extent that he feels he's finally on par with Nino Schroeter, but he's deciding to bypass those mountain bike world championships in order to target the road world championships at Yorkshire. I would not like to be a professional cyclist. If I decided to target those world championships, I would be quaking in my boots knowing that Remco Evenepoel and Mathieu van der Poel are gonna turn up there and bloody wreck it for everybody else. Now don't tell me Chris Pritchard's cycling news show isn't bringing you the most up-to-date news just again just about to press that render button on this video get it out to you guys and we've got breaking news you know we just spoke about Mathieu van der Poel taking literally the whole summer off of road cycling to concentrate on mountain biking well he's come back and he's racing at the Tour of Norway and he's only gone and bloody won it so this right here is the uh, the final kilometer of the Arctic Tour of Norway as you can see Steve Cummins doing what he failed to do in the Tour de France, and that's get off the front and actually put in an attack. Now, I know the results, so obviously they do catch him, but there you go, you can see a group of maybe 25, 30 riders there. Was that a was that a, um, a Madison sling in there, right at the back there? Just go back, Pritch. Okay, see it? Those Jumbo Visma riders just having a bit of a hand sling going on. I, I don't think that that was um, any of the riders that finished up near the front, but you can see that strung out now. Cummins is putting in a good effort here. He's definitely committing to this. But as I say, I know the result, so um, he, he definitely doesn't last. Very unorganized in that group. That group's whittling itself down now. But but there's no there's no sprint lead outs there. This is a select group that's obviously made it into this um, this last kilometer. I don't quite know the parkour of this course, um, but clearly it wasn't a, a day for the sprinters. So. Coming up with, what, what's that, 300 metres to go. They're closing in there. You've got Astana on the front. To the left of him, you've got Mathieu van der Poel sat on the front, not waiting for anybody to take the sprint up, not trying to rely on anybody else, not trying to get out of the wind. Just went. Look at that. As time to turn round, salute the victory winner, Danny van Poppel in second place. This young lad has just come back off summer camp, basically, from, from riding his mountain bike in the woods, to taking some of the best riders on in the Arctic Tour of Norway and putting a gap into them of three seconds in a sprint. That is insane. Unbelievable. And unbelievable that we get the news to you. So quick it hurts. Now, if you want to get your spouse into cycling, maybe you should send them across to bicycling.com because a new study has shown that getting the recommended minimum of 150 minutes of moderate 
or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise each week improves sexual function and satisfaction. Men cycling about 10 hours a week at a pace of about 16 miles an hour were 22% less likely to have issues down below than men who rode two hours or less a week. So there you go. Next time you're talking to your friends down the pub and they're like, hey, I bet you're gonna lose all function down there because you spend so long in the saddle, you can say no. Solid as a rock down there. But it's not just those men who benefit from this, women also benefit. Because women who cycled moderately for 5.5 hours a week experience better arousal and orgasm satisfaction. Link down in the description to that report if you wanna go and get all your facts on how you can increase what's happening between the sheets by simply going and riding your bike. And now you can use that as a perfectly valid excuse. Listen, spouse, man or woman, if you want me to perform better in there, I need to go out training for four hours. All right? Can't argue against it, can they? Because if they do, in effect, what they're saying is, oh, so you, you don't want, you don't want to be pleasured. Is that what you're saying? All right, we're going to finish off today's show. Maybe this is going to be a thing on a Thursday now where we review cycling related memes. If you don't follow the Cycling Hub community page, it's literally just one massive meme. Make sure, links down in the description, make sure you go and follow it for all your cycling meme needs. Anyway, the creator of that, the meme king himself, Niels Helden, has sent me over various different, <laughs> various different memes to review. Now, I've, I've not looked at these, I've suppressed the urge to, to look at them because I, wanna, I want real time reaction, uh, but we're gonna get into it now. So, um, meme review. <laughs> Latest season bingo, won a race, overtrained, broke a bike, did a fondo, dropped someone, <laughs> drove four plus hours for a race, got a new bike, took a KOM, upgraded categories, road track, made some new friends, stung by a bee, free lap, <laughs> did a training camp, crashed, DFL the race, preems, bonus squares, ignored your, ignored your training plan, started a meme account, <laughs> Got stabbed by a through axle and hashtag crosses coming. So you can now play the latest season of, of cycling bingo right there. That's over on cat three memes, golden. How old did horses get? <laughs> That's definitely made by Neil. How old is Chris Pritchard? 36. Uh, when you get up the first climb. Yeah, I definitely, I feel like that. When someone has a profile pic of them off the front in a bike race, but they're actually off the back, you are fake news. Admit it, who's done that? Transfer news, Quintana's new team, 100% committed to almost making a podium, maybe. <laughs> Love that. This is from the Cycling Hub community. My coach seen me come back from my summer training camp. Much slower than before, amazing. <laughs> oh dear. Com holder, com hunter. Friendly group ride. Weeks of attempts marked private. <laughs> nice. Look, I've been around the world, okay? Whatever it is, I'll understand. Balancing high intensity and low intensity rides to get faster. There's nothing about this I understand. <laughs> yep, riding buddy. <laughs> Why did you miss the start of the group ride this morning? <laughs> me? <laughs> that is me. That is me. One hour poo. <laughs> Jesus. Rich parents. Spoiled junior after losing a race. Come closer. I need, I need 404 fire crests. Oh, those are good. That concludes meme review for today. I like that. That's coming back next week. I love getting uh, involved in those memes. I'll be honest, a couple of them went over my head, but all in all, good memes. And finally, in an update from yesterday's video where we spoke about Cameron Jeffers being shortlisted for the Cycling Weekly Awards as one of the best domestic riders of this year, it appears after the Cam Army spam the hell out of the poll that it wasn't really the poll. Cycling Weekly tweeted, this is just a teaser. The judging panel will meet at the end of September to pick the shortlist. Thanks for all your recommendations. Hashtag backtracking. Thanks for watching everybody, make sure you tune in tomorrow. If you've enjoyed the video, give it a massive thumbs up. It helps the channel. If you've not done already, hit that subscribe button. If you didn't enjoy it, feel free to hit that dislike button, but give me a reason why. Until tomorrow, 